This is the motto of the show, Hour of the Truth. Rome never changes. They used to call us heretics and sent the Inquisition to kill us. Today they call us terrorists and send on their crusades. Times and methods may have changed, the goal still stays the same. Extirpate the remnant of the true word of God, Bible believing people who will hold the truth in Jesus Christ's name. Suffering at the hands of Rome Cause they believed in Christ alone They died through Europe, especially Spain For they saw all but Christ is vain He suffered by His death for men To save them from their awful sin Six hundred years of martyred saints that history cannot erase with iron heel and iron hand the Roman popes rule the land those ignorant of history may be swept into apostasy we won't be loved by Rome, sweet lie With fifty million reasons why Salvation is by faith alone In Christ alone, by grace alone A sovereign God give faith to man Salvation's in the Maker's hand This gospel offends Rome today they offer up another way, a counterfeit, a compromise. Beware the ancient papal lie with such a cloud of witnesses who by grace died in their Lord. Recall their memory to say, by the same faith we live today. Hello and welcome to another video from Jokla 66, Hour of the Truth. As you could already see in the very first screen, yes, this is another recording of the wonderful book from Patrick von Limborch from 1692, History of the Inquisition. And this will be the last part of this part of the book because we finally uh, came to the end of this section of the introduction within the next few pages. So this will probably be a little bit shorter reading than the others, not for one hour. But um, I will take my time then to prepare the next part of the book. And um, we just will finish with this part of the introduction of the book, History of the Inquisition, today. Um, this is the 1st of April. I haven't been able to read for the last three days because I have been reading so many other things. It's just incredible what the Lord can give one if he asks for the truth all to study, you know. Incredible. I just love it. <laughs> and I'm not a McDonald's fan <laughs> saying I'm loving it. But uh, I enjoy myself very much reading this book and I hope you, my dear listeners and viewers, will too. Up to now I have uploaded four parts of this book reading on my second YouTube channel and I didn't receive any comment uh, on the reading so let's see whether you like it or not I will continue reading it and share this with anyone who wants to hear it and wants to see it so we are continuing on the bottom of page 87 where you see this little highlighted uh, part of the sentence continue reading here the 29th so that's, uh, like I said, a few days ago. Today is the 1st of April, 2007, and I'm going to continue here in the reading. In the beginning of King James's reign, and this time we are talking about King James II, 
who has nothing to do with King James I, who gave us the King James Bible, and who we also learned was also of a persecuting power. But in the beginning of King James II's reign, these rigorous proceedings were continued. But as the design of that unhappy bigoted prince was to, uh, was to subvert the religion and law of these kingdoms, he published in the year 1687 a declaration for general liberty of conscience to all persons, of what persuasion whatsoever, not out of any regard or affection to the Protestant dissenters, but for the promoting of the popish religion and interest. So when King James I was the one who brought us the Protestant King James Bible, we learn in this little sentence that King James II had nothing but the same name. He was a papist. And how can we say that? Because he published in 1687 a declaration for general liberty of conscience to all persons, of what persuasion soever, not out of any regard or affection to the Protestant dissenters, but for the promoting the Popish religion and interest. When we read this closely, that means that James II gave a quote-unquote freedom of religion in a country that was ruled up to that time under Protestant rules where there is no freedom of religion to Catholicists, because Catholics only want the freedom to worship God in their way, their God in their way, the God of Roman Catholicism, which is not the God of the Bible. And here we have something a hundred years about before the founding of the United States of America, where King James II is actually promoting freedom of religion into Protestant England. And he will get the bill right afterwards, because, you know, in 1688 came the Glorious Revolution, right? So... This is what King James II did. He published in 1687 a declaration for a general liberty of conscience to all persons, of what persuasion soever, that sounds very nice for a Protestant at first, not out of any regard for affection to the Protestant dissenters, but for the promoting of the Popish religion and interest. He also caused an order of counsel to be passed that this declaration of indulgence should be read in all churches and chapels in the time of divine service, all over England and Wales. So to make sure that all church-going people at that time, which were almost everybody, got the news. But though the dissenters used the liberty which was thus granted them, and had several opportunities to have been revenged on their former persecutors, yet they had too much honour and regard to the Protestant religion and liberties ever to fall in with the measures of the court and lend their assistance to introduce arbitrary power and popery. And as the divines of the Church of England, when they saw King James's furious measures to subvert the whole constitution, threw off their stiff and haughty carriage towards the dissenters, owned them for brethren, put on the appearance of the spirit of peace and charity, and assured them that no such rigorous methods should be used towards them for the future. Things that never entered into their hearts, whilst they were triumphant in power, and which nothing but a sense of their own extreme danger seems then to have extorted from them. The dissenters, meaning Protestants, far from following their resentments, readily entered into all the measures with them for the common safety, and were amongst the first and heartiest friends of the revolution under King William III of glorious and immortal memory. 
Now we have to understand that we are coming to the time of the writing of this book, uh, King William the Third, that is William of Orange. And you know that uh, to his wife Queen Elizabeth, uh, Queen, sorry, <laughs> uh, Queen Mary the Second, I think it was, as I told you in the beginning of this uh, of this video, that to her uh, was this book devoted. So everything that we read right now cannot be from the original author, but has to be an addendum uh, that had to be made by the uh, translator, by Samuel Chandler, when he translated this book, because we are even going. Now into the history, uh, as you can read here on the other page, 1711, 1714, and a book that is written in 1692 cannot see into the future. So all this at least has to come from, um, from the translator. I even think, reading this right now in this way, that even this whole introduction is coming from uh, not the author, pa Philip van Limborch itself, but it's more an introduction from Samuel Chandler himself. I don't know, anybody who has interest in looking that out can look that out, can, can search that out. I don't care for that. I am interested in the historical um, facts that are given in this book. And um, to me, I don't care whether Samuel Chandler wrote it or Philip from Limbaugh wrote it, as long as it is documented history and it uh, helps us understand the history of the Inquisition, I don't care who wrote it. It must have been one of the two. Hmm. Now, soon after the settlement of this prince upon the throne, which was William III, an act was passed for exempting their majesty's protestant subjects dissenting from the church of england from the penal laws and though the king in a speech to the two houses of parliament told them that he hoped they would leave room for the admission of all protestants that were willing and able to see uh, to to serve him agreeable to which a course was ordered to be brought into the house of lords to take away the necessity of receiving the sacraments to make um, to make persons capable of offices yet his majesty's gracious gracious intentions were frustrated as the course rejected by great majority what did we just read a clause was ordered to be brought into the House of Lords to take away the necessity of receiving sacraments to make persons capable of offices. In other words, they wanted to introduce a clause in the, in the law that it is not necessary anymore to receive the sacraments <coughs> which are all Roman Catholic based to make persons capable of offices. Meaning, <clears throat> you can also hold an office if you did not receive this, these sacraments. But this was rejected by a great majority. Meaning, they hold on to tradition. Another cause also that was afterwards added, that the receiving the sacrament in the Church of England or in any other Protestant congregation should be sufficient qualification, met with the same fate as the former. So when they say, okay, we do not sustain the sacraments of the Roman Catholic Church, but you can even receive the sacraments in any church of England or in any Protestant congregation that should be sufficient for you to hold an office. This met the same fate as the former, meaning it was rejected by a great majority. Think about that. How biblical is that government that does these steps? It can call itself protest until the cows come home. I don't care. It is just not very protestant to me to make laws like that. So that 
the dissenters were freed from penal laws, they were left under a band of infamy and rendered incapable of serving their king and country and the Lord's Supper laid open to be prostit uh, prostituted by law to the most abandoned and profligate sinners and an institution designed for the union of all Christians made the test of a party and the means of their separation from each other a scandal that remains upon the Church of England to this day and I think this is even this day 2017 but of course now we are already behind the complete ecumenical movement where all the churches, also that of England, the Anglican Church, surrendered to the wings of Rome again. So, we can say that that scandal remains upon the Church of England even to this day in 2017. It is indeed but too plain that when the established Church saw itself out of danger, and the established Church, of course, was the Roman Catholic Church, she forgot the promises of moderation and con uh, condescensions taught the dissenters who readily and openly declared their willingness to yield to a coalition. So, meaning, once that Rome rules supreme, she forgets all the promises of quote-unquote freedom, liberty, she gave to her quote unquote dissenters, as it is written in this book. But as the clergy had formed a resolution of contending to no alter, to, of consenting to no alterations in order to such an union, all the attempts made to this purpose became wholly ineffectual. Indeed, their very exemption from the penal laws was, uh, was envied envied by many, and several attempts were made to disturb and prosecute them in this reign, but were prevented from taking effect by royal injunctions. Now, upon the death of King William and the succession of Queen Anne, the hatred of the clergy towards the dissenters had that lurked uh, it's probably Queen Anne who was um, the uh, uh, the wife of uh, King William, right? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Forget it. <laughs> I'm just going to take the sentence again. Upon the death of King William and the succession of Queen Anne, the hatred of the clergy towards the dissenters that had lurked in their breasts during the former reign immediately broke out. Several sermons were preached to render them odious and expose them to the fury of the mob. A bill was brought in and passed by the House of Commons for preventing occasional conformity, imposing an hundred pounds penalty upon every person resorting to a conventicle or meeting after his admission into office, and five pounds for every day of continuance in such offices, after having been present at such conventicle. Now, I high marked the word conventicle first here because I couldn't read it because as you can see there is even a letter missing and then I see in the next sentence here but it is the word conventicle so I looked that up because I was not familiar with the word conventicle are you? well I'm going to tell you what it is a conventicle is a secret or unlawful religious meeting typically of people with non-conformist views that means to me as a protestant I would, <laughs> you know what's coming, right? I call every Roman Catholic council a conventicle because it's an unlawful religious meeting. Unlawful because it does not adhere to the laws of our Lord. Typically with people, non-conformist views. Yeah, non-conformist to the Bible, you are not. But this is how twisted this world is. Calling every conventicle or meeting that is outside of the Roman Catholic Church a conventicle, meaning an unlawful religious meeting typically of people with nonconformist views, instead of the other way around. Just wanted to make this little point. When I found what this word conventicle means, I said I meant I said, yeah, 
and it is absolutely again used the other way around. It's like when the Pope calls us terrorists, where he is the main terrorist in the world. He's the one responsible for bringing down the towers in 9-11, in case you didn't know. But upon some disagreement between the Lords and Commons, the author continues, the bill dropped for that time. The same bill, with some few alterations, passed the House of Commons the next two sessions, but was rejected by the Lords. During this reign, several pamphlets were published, containing bitter invectives against the dissenters and exciting the government to extirpate and destroy them. Several prosecutions were also carried on against them for searching schools, etc., with great eagerness and malice. In 1709 an open rebellion broke out when the mob pulled down the meeting houses and quickly burned the pews and pulpits. Sacreverell was trumpeted to the rebellion uh, by preaching treason and persecution and the parliament that censured him was hastily dissolved. The parliament that uh, succeeded in 1711 was a true Tory spirit and complexion means completion and in its second session passed the bill against occasional conformity. The next parliament, which met in 1714, was of the same disposition and passed a bill to prevent the growth of schism, by which the dissenters were restrained from teaching schools or from being tutors to instruct pupils in any family without the license of the, bishop, uh, of the archbishop or bishop of the diocese where they resided, and the justices of the peace and power given them finally to determine in all cases relating thereto. Another bill was also intended to be brought in against them to, in, uh, to, incap to, incapacitate, to incapacitate them for voting in elections for Parliament men, or being chosen members of Parliament themselves. Before these unjust proceedings and their effect, the Protestant succession in His late Majesty King George I took place. Queen Anne dying off the 1st of August, the very day on which the schism bill was to have commenced, which, together with that to prevent occasional conformity, were both repealed by the first parliament called together by that excellent prince. And I cannot help thinking that the Church of England had then consented to have set the dissenters entirely free by repealing the, th uh, the Test and Corporation Acts. It would have been much to its own honour and reputation, as well as a great strength and security to the national interest. But the time was not then come. We still labour under the oppression of those two acts, and notwithstanding our zeal for His Majesty's person and family, must sit down, as easy as we can, with the inclination to serve him, whilst, by law, we are denied the opportunity and power. Now the sentiments of this late majesty, of glorious memory, which respect, with respect to moderation and the tolerating of dissenters, were so fully understood by the whole nation, as kept the clergy in tolerable good order and from breaking out into many outrages against them. But the controversy that began amongst themselves soon discovered what spirit many of them were of. The then Bishop of Bangor, the now worthy and reverend Bishop of Salisbury happened in a sermon before His Majesty to assert the supreme authority of Christ as King in his own kingdom, and that he had not delegated his power, like temporal lawgivers during their absence from their kingdoms, to any persons as his deputies and vice-regents. Did you get what I just read to you? I think we have to read this very important little sentence once again. This is real Protestantism. This is a Protestant bishop telling a king his place. The then Bishop of Bangor the now worthy and reverend Bishop of Salisbury happened in a sermon before His Majesty 
to assert the supreme authority of Christ as king in his own kingdom. What is the kingdom of Christ? He made the world and everything that's in it, right? And that he had not delegated his power, his temporal lawgivers during their absence from their kingdoms to any persons as his deputies and vice regents. In other words, King Jesus, the King and the Lord of this world, did never declare or did never delegate his power to any temporal lawgivers during his absence. This is actually what this little sentence means, as, leaders, as I understand it. And I think it is wonderful from the Bishop of Bangor to do this in a sermon before His Majesty and telling him frankly what he thinks of his rule. Now, in the year 1717, he also published his preservative in which he advanced some positions contrary to temporal and spiritual tyranny and on behalf of the civil and religious liberties of mankind. The goodness of his lordship's intentions to serve the family of his present majesty, the interest of his country and the honor of the church of God might, methinks, have screened him from all scurrilous abuses. But how numerous were his adversaries and how hard the weapons with which they attacked him. Not only the dregs of the people and clergy opened against him, but mighty men and men of great renown fr from whom better things might have been expected entered the lifts, <coughs> entered the lifts with him. And because he, uh, the, the avowed champions for spiritual power and the division of the kingdom between Christ Jesus and themselves, his lordship of Bangor had his manifest uh, advantage upon the face of the argument. He pleaded for Christ's being king in his own kingdom. His adversaries pleaded for the translation of his kingdom to certain spiritual viceroys. He for liberty of private judgment in matters of religion and uh, he for liberty of private judgment in matters of religion and conscience, they for dominion over the faith and consciences of the orders. He, still the Bishop of Bangor, against, and Christ, of course, he against all the methods of persecution, they for penal laws, for cooperation and test acts, and the powerful motives and positive and negative discouragement. Means he, with the spirit of meekness and of a friend to truth, they, with bitterness and rancour, and an evident regard to interest and party. However, the lower house of convocation accused and prosecuted him for attempting the subversion of all government and discipline in the Church of Christ, with a view, undoubtedly, of bringing him under a spiritual censure, and with impeaching the real uh, the regal supremacy and causes ecclesiastical to subject him to the weight of a civil one of the bishop it must be said to his everlasting honor that the temper he discovered under the opposition he met with and the slanders that were thrown on him was as much more amiable than that of his adversaries as his cause was better his writings and principles more consistent and his arguments more conclusive and convincing. That's because he speaks with the mind of Christ, this bishop. But notwithstanding these advantages, his lordship had great reason to be thankful to God that the civil power supported and protected him. Otherwise, his enemies would not, in all probability, have been content with throwing scandal upon his uh, character, but forced him to have parted with something, and then delivered him unto Satan for the punishment of his flesh, and made him and made him have felt the weight of that authority which God made him the happy and honourable instrument of opposing, especially if they were all of them of a certain good archdeacon's mind, who thought he deserved to have his tongue cut out. The dissenters also have had their quarrels and controversies amongst themselves, and managed them with great warmth and eagerness of temper. 
during their persecution under King Charles II and the common danger of the nation under his brother James, they kept tolerably quiet. The designs of the common enemy to ruin them all, uniting them the more firmly amongst themselves. But after the revolution, when they were secure from oppression or by the civil power, they soon fell into eager disputes about justification and other points of the like nature. The high-flown orthodox party should scarce know their own for their brethren those who were for moderation in these principles or who differed in the least of their doctrine concerning them. And when they could no longer produce reason and scripture in their defense, they, some of them, made use of infamous methods or scandal and endeavored to blast the character of a reverend and worthy divine, Dr. Williams, in the most desperate manner, because they could no otherwise answer and refute his arguments. When you can no longer produce reason and scripture in your defense, you resort to lies and cheat and deceive. And that is exactly what the Roman Catholic Church all is about and what we see over and over again. But this virtue stood the shock of all their attempts to, def to defame it. For after about eight weeks spent in an inquiry into his life by a commitment of the United uh, Ministers, which received all manner of complaints and accusation against him, it was declared at a general meeting as their unanimous opinion and repeated and agreed to, the, uh, to three several meetings successively, that he was entirely clear and innocent of all that was laid to his charge. Meaning... All the false accusations, the lying and deceit, did not resort to the result they wanted to have when they could no longer produce reason and scripture in their defense. So, we can almost understand that here justice was done. Thus was he vindicated in the amplest form, after the strictest examination that could be made, and his adversaries, who dealt in defamation and scandal, if not brought to repentance, were yet put to silence. It was almost incredible how much he was a sufferer for his opposition to anti antinominianism, antinominianism, but by a strong party who left nothing unattempted to crush him, if it had been possible. But at his innocence, um, sorry, but as his innocence appeared the brighter, after his character had been thoroughly uh, sifted, he was under God greatly instrumental in putting up uh, in putting a stop to those pernicious, opinion, uh, pernicious opinions which his opposers propagated, which struck at the very essentials of all nature and revealed religion. His gospel truth remains a monument of his honor, a monument his enemies were never able to destroy. However, nothing would serve but his exclusion from the merchant's lecturer at Pinner's Hall. Three other worthy divines who had been his partners in that service bore him company and their places were supplied with four others of unquestionable ruggedness and sterling orthodoxy. Many papers were drawn up on each side in order to an accommodation, so that it looked, as Dr. Kellamy tells us, as if the creed-making age was being again revived. It was insisted that Armenianism should be renounced on one side, and anti Nominianism on the other. But all was in vain, and the papers that were drawn up to compose matters created new heats, instead of extinguishing the old ones. These contentions were kept up for several years, till at last the disputants grew weary, and the controversy thread, uh, threadbare when it dropped of itself. The next thing that divided them was the Trinitarian controversy. We know that the Trinitarian controversy, that the Trinitarian uh, 
Heresy was introduced in the Council of Nicaea in 325, and we are still dealing with this here in the 17th century, and even 18th century. So the next thing that divided them was the Trinitarian controversy and the affair of subscription to human creeds and articles of faith as a test of orthodoxy. In the year 1695 a great contest arose about the Trinity amongst the divines of the Church of England who charged each other with uh, tritheism and sabellinianism. And according to the ecclesiastical manner of managing disputes, bestowed invectives and scurrilous language very plentifully upon each other. The dissenters in the reign of his late majesty not only unfortunately fell into the same debate, but carried it on, some of them at least, with equal want of prudence and temper. In the west of England, where the fire first broke out, moderation, Christian forbearance and charity seemed to have been wholly extinguished. The reverend and learned Mr. James Pierce, minister of the city of Exeter, was dismissed from his congregation upon a charge of heresy and treated by his opposers with shameful rudeness and insolence. Other congregations were also practiced with and to discard their pastors upon the same suspicion, who were accused of impiously denying the Lord that bought them to render them odious to their congregations merely because they could not come up to the unscriptural tests of human orthodoxy. And when several of the ministers of London thought proper to interpose and try if by advice for peace they could not compose the differences of their brethren in the West, this Christian design was seriously opposed as if it had been a combination to extirpate Christianity itself. And the proposal made in the room of it that the article of the Church of England and the answer of the Assembly's Catechism relating to the Trinity should be subscribed by all the ministers as a declaration of their faith and a test of their orthodoxy. This proposal was considered by many of the ministers not only as a thing unreasonable in itself, thus to make inquisition into the faith of orders, but highly inconsistent with the character of Protestants descending from the national establishment and descending it uh, from it for this reason amongst others, because the established church expressly claims an authority and controversies of faith. The established church is the Roman Catholic Church, and the Roman Catholic Church claims an authority and controversies of faith. That is because in 1870 the Pope was declared infallible when he speaks on dogmas of faith, when he speaks ex cathedra. We see this here in the same history in England already. The established church expressly claims an authority and controversies of faith means their teaching, their dogmas, and nothing else. There is no compromise Rome is ready ever to make. And therefore, the author continues, after the affair had been debated for a considerable while, the question was solemnly put and the proposal rejected by a majority of voices. This the zealots were highly displeased with and accordingly, public, uh, accordingly publicly proclaimed their resentments from the pulpits. F fasts were appointed solemnly to deplore, confess and pray against the aboundings of heresy. <laughs> fasts were appointed solemnly to deplore, confess and pray against the aboundings of heresy. That is what the Roman Catholic Church does to get her will done. She orders fasts and prayer to the aboundings of heresy, meaning any other belief but the Roman Catholic satanic belief. Fasts were appointed solemnly to deplore, confess 
and pray against the aboundings of heresy and their sermons directly leveled against the two great evils of the church, non-subscription and Arianism. Through the goodness of God they had no power to proceed farther. And when praying and preaching in this manner began to grow tedious, and whereby experience found to prove ineffectual, <laughs> because they did not pray under the Holy Spirit to our Father in heaven through Jesus Christ, but they were praying to Satan, to put a stop to the progress of the cause of liberty, their zeal immediately abated, the cry of heresy was seldom heard, and the, uh, and the alarum of the churches being endangered by pernicious errors gradually ceased, it being very observable that through heresy be ever in its nature the same thing, yet that the cry against it is either more or less, according as the political managers of it can find more or fewer passions to work on, or a greater or lesser interest to subserve by it. And thus have I brought the history of persecution down to our own times. Meaning, we were speaking about the time of the pagan Rome, and we were speaking about the time of papal Rome until the beginning of the 18th century. And thus have I brought the history of persecution down to our own time. If church history would have afforded me anything better, I assure my reader he should have had it told with pleasure. The story as it is I have told with grief, but this time to dismiss him from from so ungrateful an entertainment, and see what useful reflections we can make on the whole. And that we will do next time when we continue on page 93 of the introduction, still, but this time we are starting in section 3, Remarks upon the History of Christian Persecution. And we will learn a lot of things that we have not learned yet, and... This will go on, I think, until the end of this very first volume, and then we will start with volume two of The History of the Inquisition by Patrick van Limborch, written in 1692 and introduced by, by the translator Samuel Chandler in his uh, translation that was published in 1731. So, today was a little bit a shorter reading than otherwise, but I just wanted to finish this part of the introduction and then next part we continue with, like I just said, uh, section 3, Remarks upon the History of Christian Persecution. So until next time, Juggler 66 from Hour of the Truth, signing off, says God bless you and bye bye.